Good morning. We are so glad to have you joining us at uh, Papa Grove Baptist Church for worship today. Uh, my name is Jimmy. I am the pastor here and uh, just thrilled to have you here. Uh, love to actually be able to have you gather with us, uh, making the best of a bad situation. Uh, so this morning as we worship together, uh, let me ask you to do a couple things for me. Um, real simple. If you're watching us by Facebook, uh, please like and share uh, the video uh, as you watch along. The place down at the bottom, you can even uh, just punch a button and say um, amen. And the reason that's important is not for my ego, uh, but the way Facebook works is the more video is liked and shared, uh, the more Facebook elevates uh, that video where others uh, will see it and sort of help us uh, to get uh, the message out. And if you're on YouTube, uh, if you would like the video and subscribe to our channel, uh, that would be a big help. Same principle, uh, it helps to elevate uh, the video uh, in, uh, in their algorithm. Don't know how that all works, uh, but it'll help get uh, the message uh, in front of a lot more people. So uh, if you do those two things, I would appreciate it very much. Uh, uh, hope you grab your Bible. Uh, Project this up on the biggest screen possible in your house. Uh, sing along, pray along, uh, and let's worship together uh, this morning. Thank you for joining us. All right, take your Bible with me this morning and turn to the book of Psalms, the ninth Psalm. Psalm of David. He writes these words. He says, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. I will be glad and rejoice in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O thou most high. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. For thou hast maintained my right and my cause. Thou satest in the throne, judging right. Thou hast rebuked the heathen. Thou hast destroyed the wicked. Thou hast put out their name forever and ever. O thou enemy, destructions are come to perpetual end, and thou hast destroyed cities. Their memorial is perished with them. But the Lord shall endure forever. He hath prepared his throne for judgment, and he shall judge the world in righteousness. He shall minister judgment to the people in uprightness. The Lord also will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Sing praises to the Lord which dwelleth in Zion. Declare among the people his doings. When he maketh inquisition for blood, he remembereth them. He forgetteth not the cry of the humble. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Consider my trouble which I suffer of them that hate me. Thou that liftest me up from the gates of death that I may show forth all thy praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion. I will rejoice in thy salvation. The heathen are sunk down in the pit that they made, and the net which they hid is their own foot taken. The Lord is known by the judgment which he executeth. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Again, Selah. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not man prevail. Let the heathen be judged in thy sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. Selah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you today. Uh, for allowing us an opportunity uh, to worship together. Uh, God, even uh, not ideal, uh, but God, that uh, you have provided a means that we can come together as a uh, church family uh, and be able to uh, share your word together, to sing together, uh, to take a moment and uh, worship you. God, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, take this, uh, this service today, uh, use it for your glory, for your purpose, uh, that hearts would be touched. God, that someone uh, would hear your word, uh, someone uh, would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ uh, and their heart be forever changed as they come to know Christ personally uh, as their Savior. Guide us in all that we do this morning. Uh, God, that it would honor you and please you. And we'll give you the praise for it all. For it's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. All right, let's sing together this morning. Mm -hmm. 
It's time ordinarily again. It would be our uh, time for taking up the offering. And so I uh, just want to again take time to share with you this morning uh, your uh, options for uh, continuing to give to support uh, the church. Uh, one obviously is through the mail. Uh, also uh, through our website you can give uh, there. And then uh, we also have a method whereby uh, you can use your phone and text. Uh, just text a blank message to the number on the screen, uh, and then it'll take you where you can put in uh, the amount, uh, and uh, that will take care uh, of that. Don't know how all that works. I just uh, again know that it does. And so thank you uh, for continuing to support uh, your church. Uh, just share with you uh, as I talk to other pastors. Uh, around town uh, it has been uh, quite amazing uh, what God has been doing uh, it uh, many of us I guess thought uh, when all this first started uh, that we'd be out of business in two weeks but uh, God has uh, continued to be uh, faithful uh, we have had uh, our churches um, are continuing uh, to to be able to function uh, we are having uh, way more people uh, across the board. I'll, I hear from every church I talk to uh, are watching uh, the services online. Uh, we're having more people hear the gospel than we would have ever uh, had uh, in our church buildings. Uh, and so thankful for that. And financially, uh, the people are stepping forward uh, and supporting their churches. And so uh, just very thankful that uh, God is showing himself to still uh, be uh, in control. Uh, I was talking to one pastor this week, and uh, I told him, I said, I guess us pastors should have had uh, a little more faith in God than evidently uh, we do. Uh, and so I uh, just thank you uh, for, for that. Uh, I ask you again to continue to, uh, to call each other, to reach out to one another, uh, and um, just check on each other, um, and uh, just uh, to continue uh, try as much as possible uh, to continue uh, the fellowship of the church. Um, it's, um, again, not ideal, uh, but um, phone calls uh, and uh, just uh, checking or email, if you have email, uh, Facebook, just uh, encourage you to try to stay uh, connected and keep up with uh, your church family. Uh, invite people to uh, watch the videos with you uh, from church. There may be people who would uh, watch the video who would never uh, come into the church with you. And so just thank you uh, again for your uh, support, not just financially, uh, but um, overall uh, of your church, your prayers, uh, how God is continuing to, uh, to work in his church. All right, if you'll take your Bible this morning and uh, turn to the book of Nehemiah. Uh, those of you who are uh, regular uh, at, uh, at Poplar Grove, know that uh, before all this started, uh, we've been uh, working our way through uh, the book of Nehemiah on uh, the theme, the topic uh, of rise up and build. Uh, 
and we uh, just to refresh your memory since it's been a while uh, if you remember the Nehemiah uh, was allowed and I'm gonna have to paraphrase quickly about 12 chapters here uh, had been allowed uh, he was uh, had been uh, taken away in captivity but he was allowed uh, to go back to Jerusalem when he heard that Jerusalem had been uh, was in ruins he asked for permission to go back uh, and rebuild Jerusalem uh, he goes back and uh, begins to rebuild the walls and uh, re-fortify uh, the city. Uh, and uh, then he begins to work towards bringing spiritual uh, revival uh, among the people. After about 12 years, uh, Nehemiah goes, goes back uh, to Artaxerxes and uh, goes back uh, and uh, he's burdened and asks, uh, eventually asks if he can go back to Jerusalem. Uh, when he gets back to Jerusalem, uh, he finds that many of the things that uh, the people had covenanted to do uh, during uh, their uh, during the rebuilding of the wall that they had uh, they had broken those promises. Uh, they had forsaken. Uh, and so Nehemiah begins then to, uh, to lay out what they need for uh, genuine revival. Uh, and we've been looking at those things. And uh, this morning, I, I want us to, to go back. And uh, I think uh, in God's uh, timing, uh, good, uh, good timing uh, that we come back now at this point uh, to this chapter uh, and look at uh, this topic, Reformation uh, and Revival. We won't, uh, I'm afraid, oftentimes in our churches, we won't revival uh, without any real reformation, without any real uh, change uh, in our life, any real change in our churches. We want to keep doing what we've been doing uh, and God to bless it and to bring about revival uh, in, in, in that environment. Uh, and we, we know, uh, instinctively, we know that that doesn't work. Uh, as uh, someone has uh, said, is the, 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 the picture, the definition uh, of crazy uh, is, uh, is to expect something, to keep doing what you've been doing and expect different results. And so uh, Nehemiah is going to come in uh, here in this 13th and final chapter uh, in, in the book, and he's going to lay out uh, five things that uh, are required uh, for revival that he sees going on uh, among uh, the Israelites. And I think uh, they are appropriate uh, for us today because many of us uh, are praying uh, for revival. We're praying uh, for even out of uh, this pandemic, out of this crisis, uh, that uh, God will move. Uh, and I, I believe that. I, I've been claiming uh, all throughout this what Joseph said to his brothers uh, when he told them what you meant for evil, God meant for good. I'm believing uh, that when this is over with, that people are going to be in love with their church. They're going to recognize the importance of their church. Uh, again, that through uh, technology, uh, that many people are hearing the gospel uh, that uh, haven't heard it uh, in the past. And, and so therefore, they're going to, uh, I, I'm believing that God is going to do something miraculous and grand uh, as this uh, moves forward. Uh, but there are five things that, uh, that we have, to, I believe that uh, Nehemiah points out here that uh, we need to be aware of. Uh, that we need to be cautious of uh, in the church. Again, there had been uh, a great move in, in Jerusalem. They've rebuilt the walls. They have, uh, they have reestablished the temple. Uh, but now they have already uh, began some backsliding. Uh, they've already began to start uh, slipping back from those original uh, commitments uh, that they made. And so Nehemiah is going to come here uh, and um, he's really going to, uh, you know, it's what somebody said, you know, he's going to move from preaching to meddling. Uh, he's really going to get uh, very serious and very stern uh, with, the, with the people of Jerusalem uh, as he points out these things that, uh, that he sees that have uh, slipped while he he, uh, was gone. And now that he is back, uh, he says to him, we're just going to uh, walk through this 13th chapter uh, 
Uh, and it begins, uh, interestingly enough, uh, on verse 1, it says, On a day uh, that they read in the book of Moses, they were reading the law uh, in the audience of the people, uh, that they found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite uh, should not come into the congregation of God uh, forever. He goes on and he explains why. And so uh, Nehemiah and, and the people uh, make this first recognition uh, that they had uh, allowed uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites to come in uh, into their temple, into uh, the very worship uh, of their God. Now you say, uh, what's the problem with that? Isn't that uh, a good thing? They were doing evangelism. They were doing uh, missions work. Well, no. This is a failure uh, to regularly separate. Uh, if you look at this uh, again, and this goes back uh, to the book of Deuteronomy that uh, God had commanded that the Moabites and the Ammonites, uh, as it says here in verse 1, should not come into the congregation of God forever. Why? Because they met not the children of Israel with bread and water, uh, but hired Balaam against them that he should curse them. Howbeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. What had happened, and, and without uh, going into a great deal of time here, uh, as the Israelites uh, had come out of Egypt, the Moabites and the Ammonites had tried uh, to get Balaam uh, to put a curse uh, on the Israelites. And because of that, uh, God said uh, He forbade them uh, from ever uh, coming in uh, to, the, to the temple uh, to worship. And so uh, as we lead us, well, what is uh, God saying here? The first violation, the first uh, mistake uh, that the Jews uh, had made uh, in Jerusalem as they began uh, to rebuild and, and reestablish uh, worship was they had failed to separate themselves uh, from the foreigner. Now, we, we want to be careful there. I'm not talking about, uh, you know, uh, prejudice or uh, those kinds of things. But what God is establishing here is that there should be a difference uh, between God's people and the world. That there should be a, a distinction between uh, the actions and the, the ways, the attitudes, the words, the language. Uh, there should be a distinction uh, between God's people uh, and everyone else. There, there should be, uh, there, there should be a uh, the, the, we should have, man should have the ability uh, to, to, to observe a, a Christian and, and in short order he may not know what it is he may not be able to explain it he may not be able to say uh, yes that person is, is a Christian but, but he should be able uh, to watch us in our workplace he should be able to watch us interact with our family with our children he should be able to see us uh, in the marketplace and say I don't know what it is, but there is something different uh, about that person. Uh, what had happened in Jerusalem uh, was they had accepted again uh, the Moabites and the Ammonites in. Um, and, and we're going to see as we move through this chapter what happens. They, they, began, to, uh, they, they began to allow them in, and, and eventually they're going to begin to take on their ways. They're going to begin uh, to act like them, walk like them, talk like them, uh, and, and it becomes a real issue. Uh, and so for revival, uh, the reformation here uh, that he's talking about uh, for the Jews was, uh, as the Bible tells us, come out uh, and be separate, to be different. Now, again, that doesn't mean we don't have relationships. We don't have uh, friends who are lost. In fact, uh, just the opposite. I, I feel like every Christian ought to have uh, several uh, people who are, who are lost, uh, who, are, who they are actively uh, working on uh, sharing and showing them uh, the gospel of Jesus Christ. But there is a difference in knowing uh, a lost man. There is a difference in trying to influence them and, and allowing the world uh, to influence us. Uh, one of the great hindrances, I think, may, maybe one of the great things that uh, may come out of uh, these, uh, this period uh, of the church being closed is, is a purging uh, of the world. Uh, that we have allowed <coughs> the world influence uh, into 
uh, our, our church uh, into our worship, into how we uh, conduct church. And, uh, and so Nehemiah points out to them here uh, that even back into Deuteronomy, uh, that they are to be different, they are to be distinct. Again, let me just emphasize to you, uh, again, that's not prejudice that's not uh, that, that, that's not uh, rejecting people because of skin color or nationality uh, in fact it's not rejecting people at all it is the difference in influence that we uh, as the church should be influencing the world not the world influencing us and so he says to them, first of all, uh, that there was a failure to separate. That they had allowed uh, the Ammonites and the Moabites uh, to come in uh, and influence uh, their worship. Come in and literally come into uh, the congregation and be involved uh, in the worship uh, uh, of God. Uh, and so he's telling them that they need to be separate uh, from those who are uh, living wicked lives. That we have to be cautious uh, that we don't allow the world uh, to influence who we are. And so a failure to regularly separate. The second thing uh, that Nehemiah is going to point out uh, that is causing uh, a, a lack of revival that needs uh, reformation in Jewish life is not only this failure to regularly separate, but he says there's a failure uh, to retain sanctification. And the word sanctification is really uh, just another word to mean separate. Uh, and, and so uh, to become more like God. Uh, and so he says in verse 4, he says, Before this, Elisha, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber uh, of the house of our God, was allied, allied unto Tobiah. How many of you remember Tobiah? You, you, there in your living room this morning. You remember Tobiah? Tobiah was the man who, who back here a few chapters back, if you recall, what was doing everything in his power to undermine uh, and to stop the building of the wall to the point where I believe, given the opportunity, uh, he would have assassinated Nehemiah. And yet, here in verse chapter 13, we read that the high priest himself has allied himself to Tobiah to the point, look what it says in verse 5 that he prepared for him a great chamber where aforetime they laid the meat offerings, the frankincense, vessels, and tithes of corn, and, and it goes on. What, what, what's, that, what's that verse saying? The high priest had literally allowed Tobiah, the instigator, the troublemaker, to set up shop in the temple. He had taken a room of the temple and cleaned it out and allowed to buy a many believe to literally live in the temple. In other words, they had allowed this man who was a outspoken, avowed enemy of Jerusalem to move in the temple. But in all this time, he said, now Nehemiah's going to say, I wasn't in Jerusalem. He says, and I come back. Uh, and look what he says in verse 7. I came to Jerusalem and understood of the evil did for Tobiah in giving him a chamber in the court of the house of God. And it grieved me. And I cast forth all this stuff out. I like Nehemiah. Nehemiah says, I put his junk in the yard. He says, I put his stuff out in the yard. I, I, I like that, that word stuff. He says, I put his stuff out in the yard. And I commanded that they cleanse the chamber and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God. You see what he did? Way before Corona, Nehemiah goes in, he kicks him out, and he says, let's cleanse this room. Now he wasn't cleaning it for virus, he was getting it ceremonially clean. What is the principle for you and I today? First of all, we see that the people themselves had failed to regularly separate themselves from the things of this world. Second thing that had happened that was hindering revival that needed reforming was that they had failed to retain sanctification. In other words, they had allowed again to buy a room for his, 
It's almost unbelievable uh, that something like that would happen. Some believe that maybe uh, Tobiah had married in the family they got, they were in laws with the high priest or something. But for what it, it, it is almost incomprehensible that they would allow uh, this to go on in the temple. But we look at this, and, and simply what it, I, I believe the lesson for you and I today is to understand the, the importance of God's house. The importance of God's house and what goes on in God's house. I know there, there are some who right about now are going to cut off their computer or cut off their channel because they're going to say he's old fashioned. He's, uh, you know, he's out of touch. Okay, well, thank you for joining us. But at this point, I'm going to be old fashioned. God's house is meant to be God's house. It, it, it is here for a purpose. I know it's just a building, uh, I, I, but it is a building that is set aside for the worship of God. Now, let me, let me just, for a moment, some of you, if you're still with me, hang on. Because I'm going to say something that will make the rest of you probably angry. Some of you who are hearing what I just said, say, amen, preacher, that's right. Now, don't tell me how much you value God's house. How much, what you think ought to happen at God's house, what you think is wrong, and what should or shouldn't go on in God's house, and how God's house is set apart, and it's a special place, and come May or June, or whenever it is we're allowed back in God's house, you're not here. You know, what, what difference does it make what's going on? If you're not going to be part of it, we can be playing bingo. You wouldn't know the difference. If we're going to say that God's house needs, if we're going to have revival, the reformation that needs to happen, and it ought to happen the first Sunday we're allowed back in God's house. It ought to happen the first Sunday we're allowed to gather in church houses all over the land. They're, they ought to be full on that Sunday. They ought to be packed to the wall. There ought to be a line to get in. Ought to be standing room only. If we genuinely value and love God's house. These people had lost the importance of God's house. By allowing Tobiah to come in. Now, there are many people who, when it comes to God's house, if some, someone, they, they, they'll get all bent out of shape if someone sells a candy bar or someone, what they wear into God's house. And listen, I'm not saying that those things are not things that have... We, we have room to discuss those areas. What I am saying is we shouldn't worry about what somebody's wearing to God's house. We shouldn't worry about what somebody's doing in God's house if we're not going to God's house ourselves. God's house ought to have value to us. There's a reason. Listen, I, 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 I've heard people just like you have who are up in arms right now because the ABC stores are open and the church is closed. You know, there was a time when, you know, and, and there what we got what we call essential businesses. I, I don't exactly know how you define that when I look at some of the things that are open. But you know, there was a time in America where the church was one of those essential businesses. Do you think just maybe the reason that all across America our churches are closed and our governments have determined the church is not essential is because they see how church people have been treating their churches for years now. If we're going to have revival, we've got to be personally separate. We've got to value and set apart, sanctify the church and the worship of God. 
Third thing Nehemiah brings out in this passage is they had a failure to remain supportive. And I almost feel guilty uh, saying anything about this right now in this situation, but here it is in the text. You're going to see it. I, I didn't make it up. I'm just, I've just been walking straight through the book of Nehemiah. Here it is in verse 10. And I perceived that the portion of the Levites had not been given them, for the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled everyone to his field. Then contended I with the rulers, and why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. They brought all Judah, the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil into the treasuries. And I made treasures over the treasuries. And goes on uh, in that passage. What's the third thing that needed reforming to bring about revival? They had to regularly separate. They had to come out from among the people. They had to Remain sanctified. Get that church, get that temple, make it a place of God, a place of worship, a place of value. The third thing that he says is that they had a failure to remain supportive. You know why that's really important? Is because when they finished the walls and they got the temple built, they had agreed, they had covenanted that they would support financially their temple. And like I said, I, I almost feel guilty uh, saying anything about this right now because of how good, uh, how faithful God's people have been to support their church, uh, even not being able to gather. But here it is. If we're going to have revival, we're going to have one of the reforms that we're going to have to have is that men and women, we're going to have to financially support our churches. We, have, we are obligated to give and support. This passage says uh, that because of their failure to support the church, the Levites or the priests uh, had had to go out into the fields uh, and work. Now, I, I, I don't have a problem with working. I don't have a lot of a lot of my good friends or what the, the fancy word is by vocational pastor. Uh, but uh, when it's because God's people won't financially support their church, there's a problem. Why would God bless a church that the people don't support and love themselves? See, I, 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 I don't know who might be listening, but let me just tell you something. You know, one of the things that has went on steady during this pandemic, the power company still wants to be paid. Just like at your house, the water bill still has to be paid. All those things, those things still go on. Insurance. The church has expenses. And many churches, even before this started, were having to make a choice between missions and ministry and paying other bills. Listen, the church should be supported by the people. So the third thing was that they had failed to remain supportive. Why, why is that important? It's not even so much about the money, folks. But as people say, where, where your heart is. Where your heart is. Second of all, it is a commandment of God. It's a matter of obedience to God. And so he tells us to be supportive of our church. And I think, again, I, 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 I feel, again, almost guilty because I, I am so thankful. Carol has been keeping me updated on, uh, again, not, not who, but uh, the offering that's been coming in. Uh, and I am so grateful and, and so uh, praising God uh, for, for the people of this church. Uh, but I don't know who all is listening. And so I just want to point out to you, here it is, that he says they've got to remain supportive uh, of their church. And so the third reform that brings about revival is recognizing here we have a failure to separate. We have the failure of sanctification that hadn't set the church apart and made it a, a special place. That uh, obviously from that, if it wasn't special, they wasn't going to support it. Uh, and so they'd failed uh, in supporting uh, their church. Fourth thing that uh, he brings about, uh, brings up in verse 15. He says, In those days I saw in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading asses and also wines, grapes, and figs 
and all manners of burdens which they brought in Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, and I testified against them in the day wherein they sold their victuals. I want to continue to read down through verse 22. What is the fourth thing that Nehemiah brings up? We've got a failure to separate. Not coming out from among the people and being different. A failure to sanctify the church being precious and valuable. A failure to support that valuable church. And, and we see how this, it begins back with the second one. That once they let Tobiah move in and the church was no longer valuable, no longer important, no longer sanctified, no longer an important part of their life, why would they financially support it? But then once that happened, look what happens in verse 15. We keep going and uh, we see that it just is continuing to spiral uh, downhill, which sin always does. What was we then have a, a failure to respect the Sabbath. The Sabbath no longer meant anything to them. The day of worship, or the day of rest that God had given them was no longer important. They were working, they were tending their fields, it says. Uh, they allowed uh, the men of Tyre to come in uh, and, and bring their uh, their fish and their uh, all, all their wares. They, they basically managed them, allowed them to come in and set up shop in the middle of Jerusalem on the day of worship. Well, what, what is Nehemiah telling us? Revival comes when we reform our separation, not the social distancing. That uh, we got social distancing, uh, but God's talking about spiritual distancing. Our, our spirit, we, we need to be different. The, the church needs to be an important element of life. We need to support the church. But then the fourth thing he says is in that same vein, and you can see how it's kind of, again, spiraling downhill is that they had failed to respect the Sabbath. Listen, it is so important that God included it in the Ten Commandments. Listen, I, and, and I understand uh, you know, that there are a lot of things that go on. A lot of people have to make a lot of decisions uh, because of the way the workplace is today. But uh, I, I'm just going to say, as much as possible, God's day, that there are a lot of things we do on God's day besides worship, that, um, that they're not necessary. Listen, the, the, you, you ride by most ball fields, places like that, uh, I, I guarantee I can uh, line up a hundred preachers and, and march them across this platform and have them tell story after story of how uh, our young families are, are putting gymnastics and sports and uh, everything else in front uh, of, of God's day. Again, it goes back to the importance of God's house. It goes back to supporting God's day. Uh, it goes back to financially supporting. Listen, I didn't make this up. This isn't a, a, a preacher ranting and raving about what he wants changed. This is what Nehemiah said was wrong in Jerusalem. This is what Nehemiah pointed out. I'm just reading the book. I'm just trying to explain what, what Nehemiah was talking about. And Nehemiah says that they had failed to come out. I, I want you to see the progression. They had failed to separate themselves from the, the Moabites and the Ammonites. Because of that, they didn't have a problem with the temple being defiled. Well, if the temple is defiled, there's no reason to financially support the temple. Well, if the temple is defiled and there's no reason to financially support the temple, then what difference does the Lord's Day make? And so God is saying through Nehemiah uh, to, uh, to, to the Israelites here, if you want to see revival, here's where it begins. It begins with a reform of how you treat God's house on God's day. Again, I, I know that sounds self-serving for the preacher to say but again, I'm just sharing with you what the book says. Nehemiah told the people here, here's the issue. We've got to get things right at God's house. We've got to get things right in God's house on God's day. It, it, it's, it, we're not going to have revival because we call a prayer meeting or because we start reading a lot of Scripture. And all, listen, don't, 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 those are important. 
But until we get God's house, God's day, straight, then we can't expect to see revival. And then that trickles down, and what's scary about that is that trickles down into a fifth area that is extremely important in our culture. We see that he's going to move from, and again, you see the progression. They had failed to separate themselves from the Moabites and the Ammonites, which allowed the temple to be defiled. The temple's defiled. There's no reason to financially support it. If we're not going to financially support the temple and the temple's defiled, then the Sabbath itself is irrelevant. And then look what happens. You say, well, we might survive all that, but look what happens. As we move on in this chapter, you see in these last handful of verses, starting in verse 23. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashad, of Ammon, and of Moab. And her children spake half in speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, You shall not give your daughters unto sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, and was he beloved of his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. You see the progression? It started when they started failing to separate themselves from the world. That moved to defiling the temple. That moved to not financially supporting the temple. That moved to not caring and honoring the Sabbath till it eventually affected their family. Some of you may be watching this morning and thinking, well, I'm doing all right. We're doing okay not going to church. We're doing all right. Some of you may be even getting in the mindset that, you know, and I am concerned about this, and other pastors as well. Some of you, some, some who are sitting, have been sitting home these last uh, few weeks and probably a few more weeks yet to go, are, are getting in their mind, you know, I'm doing all right. I don't know. I, I may not even go back to church. I just think I'll just start watching it on TV or whatever. Let me show you what happened here. They failed to be separate. They defiled the temple. They quit supporting the church. They defiled the Sabbath till eventually it affected their family. Here's what the point of this is. As Nehemiah brings up Solomon, he brings up the, the rules that God had established for not marrying outside uh, of Israel. He's talking about forming godly families. Do you understand this morning that we will not see revival until we reform the church and reform the family? Fifth error that Nehemiah points out here in, in this passage is a failure to remember Solomon. Solomon had married all these women from all these different places and it ultimately was his downfall. It was ultimately his destruction. Now, what does he say? Is it, are we going to preach against uh, marrying multiple wives? No, that's common sense. We're, we're not talking about marrying nationalities. What we're talking about is spirituality. That God is saying, again, we see this path. It started out by hanging around Moabites and the Ammonites and allying them into their temple to the point where they defiled the temple, to the point where they quit supporting their church, their temple, to the point where they defiled the Sabbath, to the point where eventually it trickled down and began to affect their family. Look what it says in those verses. It says, Their children spoke half in the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jewish language. The Jewish children could not even speak 
the Jewish language. That's how far removed they had, that's how far they had moved from the people they were supposed to be. Now, some of you this morning, uh, let me just say, you're, you're watching and you're thinking, well, I don't know that I need church. Maybe you don't. But do you understand this morning you're, you're playing with your children and your grandchildren's future? The tone you set. Go back into 2 Chronicles. And you see the story of the king who, who disobeyed God. You see how his son was a little worse. And his grandson a little worse to the point of his descendants finally boarding up the temple and actually sacrificing babies. That's how it trickled down through their family. What do we need for revival? We need reformation. We need change. We need God's people to step up and honor God's house. And we need God's people <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. We need God's people to be bringing up godly children in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Our children today know more about sports, know more about video games, know more about schoolwork. Listen, I'm not saying there's anything wrong necessarily with some of the video games or sports, or certainly do good on your schoolwork. Don't, don't do misquote me but I'm saying there ought to be a priority in our, in our godly and Christian homes of bringing up godly children oh preacher I don't want to make my children go to church I might turn them against church you make them go to school you don't worry about turning them against school you make them wear pants you don't worry about turning them against britches you don't worry about them running around naked you make them eat. You don't worry about turning them against food. Listen, we need godly homes. And godly homes supporting and loving godly churches. Listen, revival isn't going to happen without reformation. It never has. Go back and read the history of the reformation. Reformation, change is required to bring about revival among God's people. I like, and I, I, let me just read to you something I found in a book. Mark Roberts wrote this in a book called Mastering the Old Testament. He said, what was in Israel's fundamental problem? Why did the reforms of Ezra and Nehemiah fail, at least in part? In Nehemiah 13, we see God's people allowing the world to invade what should be holy, set apart for God alone. They failed to live holy lives with respect to the temple, the Sabbath, and marriage. They invited the Gentile to, to buy it, to, to operate within the temple. Foreigners traded, tempted the Jews to dishonor the Sabbath. Men of Judah married foreign wives only to bear children who could not even speak Hebrew. Even though adultery with pagan nations had repeatedly brought national destruction, God's people still abandoned their holy status to join the world. They abandoned their holy status. My call this morning, my plea with you, is that we once again will commit ourselves to our holy status. We are called by God's Word to be different. We are called by God's Word to be set apart, to be a different people. We're told in the Word of God, come out from among them and be different. We're told we are to be new creatures, that the old things are passed away and all things become new. If we're going to see revival, we're going to have to see change and reformation in God's people. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you today for allowing us to come here this morning. God, to gather in this manner through technology to look at your word. And God, I can't imagine that there are many who will be watching this video who wouldn't agree 
of the desperate, desperate need we have for revival. But God help us to realize it's not going to come about just because we want it, just because we pray for it. But God, it requires a change on our part. It requires reformation. It requires a difference in our life. God, that we'd once again value the house of God. That we'd once again bring up godly families. God, I pray, Lord, that through this crisis that our nation is going through, God, that our hearts, our minds would be turned to you. That we'd see the value, the importance of serving you. And God, we'd see revival break out in our land, break out in our churches. Christians recommitting themselves to you, lost people coming to know Jesus Christ. God, we pray for revival, but we know that we need reformation. God, change us. Help us to see the need and make us a different people. And we'll give you the honor for it all. For it's in Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, we'll be back with you next Sunday morning. Uh, each day during the week, we'll be putting out a daily devotion uh, on Facebook or and uh, YouTube, uh, and so remember that. Uh, also, let me encourage you, set aside, some of you may have seen this, uh, May the 5th uh, as a day of prayer. Uh, uh, Fred uh, Lunsford, old mountain man, has a place up on the mountain uh, where he goes, only accessible by four-wheel drive, and he's started a movement and is moving towards uh, having 100,000 people praying uh, on May the 5th for spiritual awakening and revival. Uh, so I hope you mark that on your calendar. Uh, we'll be getting more information to you uh, as that gets closer. Have a wonderful uh, week. Thank you.